Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Berry. I'm the president of Scudic Institute, and I am very excited about tonight's program, which is co-sponsored by Scudic Institute and the Naturalist Notebook, which is an exploratorium and bookstore in Seal Harbor. And Craig and Pamelia of the Naturalist Notebook are leading a retreat here on our campus uh, for a couple of days right now that includes both tonight's presentation and a public program tomorrow night with Bernd Heinrich, who is a very well-known naturalist, ecologist, and author. So if your uh, travels don't take you too far out of town, you may want to be right back here in about 24 hours for that. I want to mention a few other things that we have coming up. Uh, this is a pretty busy week for us here on campus. On Friday afternoon, we have the Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, uh, the Director of the National Park Service, John Jarvis, and David Rockefeller, Jr., uh, giving remarks at an event at 3 o'clock in a tent right below Rockefeller Hall that is open to the public and would be certainly happy to have you join us for that as well. They'll be talking about the value of the partnership between Scudic Institute and Acadia National Park and science and youth initiatives in the National Park Service. And then the following week, we have a sunset whale watch cruise that's being offered free as a thank you to supporters of Scudic Institute by the Bar Harbor Whale Watch Company. Uh, that will be August 24th. It's a 4.30 cruise. We do need RSVPs for that and account. Uh, but there are still a few spots available. Uh, if you'd like to join that, it's 4.30 to 7.30 uh, the evening of August 24th. And if you didn't know about any of these things, you should probably be on our mailing list. And you can do that at our website, which is scudicinstitute.org. So with that, I said I was excited about tonight's program, and I am. I want to welcome Alex Filipenko, who is our speaker this evening. He is an astronomer astrophysicist professor at Berkeley and involved with the Lick Observatory whose story we will hear tonight and learn a little bit about its history and its importance. I think we're also going to learn a lot about deep space, at least uh, I am. And in addition to that, this is a very distinguished educator and speaker. He's been voted best professor at Berkeley nine times. He's been involved in producing a hundred different television documentaries related to astronomy. He's received a Carl Sagan Prize for Excellence in Science Education and Increasing the Popularity of Science for the Public. Uh, I'm missing some honors, but uh, I think that might be enough to give the idea that we're in for a treat tonight. So with that, please welcome Alex Filipenko. Sex 
specks of dust flying through. Ah, there we go. Should I put it back in my pocket? Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, you get more of them than is typically the case, okay? Um, it's best after midnight, but uh, we should see some before midnight as well. Unfortunately, we do have the moon that's just two days past full, the waning gibbous moon. So that'll brighten the skies, and we won't be able to see faint meteors, but we should still see the bright ones. The moonlight won't interfere with the bright ones. Walking over here from the dining hall, I'm getting a little bit concerned about these clouds moving in, but the hope is they won't get too thick, okay? Because, of course, they would attenuate the light from the meteors, and they reflect moonlight, making the sky brighter. So it's sort of a double whammy. Astronomers don't like clouds at night, especially when the moon is up because of this extra reflection factor. Anyway, we'll give it a try. We'll, I think, go out on the field to the right of Rockefeller Hall as you're approaching Rockefeller along the path, the short path that leads directly from the Moore Auditorium. So for those of you who want to stick around and look for some meteors, um, I welcome you to do so. Uh, I won't be there after midnight. I flew in yesterday at night and after getting up at 3 in the morning in California time. So I'm still a little bit tired, but I'll be out there for a while and you know, I won't give up until we see at least one really good one, unless the skies are completely cloudy. All right? So let's give it a try tonight, if you'd like. So I want to tell you today about Lick Observatory, a place where a, place where a lot of research is done. It's pretty far from here, you know, nearly 3,000 miles from here, but very close to Silicon Valley, just 14 miles east of San Jose. And in 1888, it was the world's first remote mountaintop observatory. It was really the birth of big science, certainly in California and arguably in, uh, in the entire United States, all right? Um, no other really big facilities existed at that time. And it was made possible because of a fellow named James Lick, not surprising given the na name now, Lick Observatory. Lick has a very interesting, colorful history. I can't really go into it right now, but suffice it to say that he arrived in San Francisco, at that time Yerba Buena, in early January 1848. He came from South America. And he arrived, I believe, just 17 days before gold was found in Sutter's Mill. All right? So, of course, people rushed off to find gold. They sold their land at a low price because they were eager to get away. When they started coming back, he was happy to sell the land back to them at a nice profit. Of course, California attracted a huge number of people during this time as well because of the gold rush. And so within three years, San Francisco was this booming metropolis, and all the land was sold to the people coming in by James Lick, who had purchased all the land right before and in the early stages of the gold rush. So he was a very shrewd businessman, all right? And he became very, very wealthy, he owned many parts of California, all right? Essentially all of what is now San Francisco. Near the end of his life, he had a, gi he had a gigantic pile of cash, all right? Uh, he essentially had no family. He had really nothing to do with this money. He had one bastard son with whom he didn't get along very well, all right? So he wanted to memorialize his parents and himself one idea, his, among his first ideas, was that he would build statues like Moai on Ocean Beach in San Francisco facing out toward the Pacific Ocean. But he was told that, you know, if we're ever attacked from out at sea, the most visible objects will be these statues and they're going to be among the first things to be knocked down. So that's not such a good idea. Then he thought he'd build a pyramid at the corner of 4th and Market Streets in San Francisco. I mean, he owns San Francisco, so he could do whatever he wants. But he was told that, you know, of course, there are giant pyramids in Egypt, Mexico, Central America. They're nothing new, so what's the big deal, a big pyramid? He was, uh, he was told by members of the California Academy of Sciences, where it was suggested to him that he do something for the benefit of humankind. And in particular, what was needed was a great telescope, the biggest and most powerful telescope ever to be built. And so, in fact, he was convinced then 
to give a gift to the University of California, which at that time was only UC Berkeley, in fact. And that gift in 1874 was $700,000. Now, I'm an academic, and so that's a lot of money for me even now in 2014. All right, imagine what it was in 1874. In fact, in 2008, a calculation was done that as a fraction of the GDP, that was equivalent to $1.2 billion. And that doesn't even count all the money and effort that has gone into the observatory since that time. It was meant to be a memorial to himself. So in fact, the great 36-inch diameter Lick refractor was indeed built. It was completed in 1888. And below the pier here, down below this floor, which is hydraulically lifted and lowered, you can see the plaque. Here lies the body of James Lick, all right? So he really is down there. Yeah, a little bit about its construction. Everything was brought up by horse and carriage. So in fact, it's a very gentle slope, but a very windy road that follows the contours of the mountain. Um, a dome housing a 12-inch refracting telescope was first built, then the main building attached to that dome, and then at the other end, the right-hand side of the main building, was the dome of the great Lick refractor under which he is buried. So that was completed in 1888. You might think that now, at age 126, Lick Observatory is no longer very relevant. But in fact, as I'll tell you today, it remains a very vibrant research institution and a place for great training of grad students, postdoctoral scholars, a lot of public outreach, a lot of instrument development, it remains just an amazing research uh, and educational institution. And that's in part because, you know, we've kept up with the times. We don't just have the old great Lick refractor, which is really no longer used for research. Uh, it's just too bulky, too unwieldy. We have new telescopes equipped with new state-of-the-art uh, instruments that are able to do cutting-edge research. And even though by today's standards, these telescopes are small. They can do research that, for example, the 10-meter telescopes in Hawaii, the Keck telescopes, can't do. Now, I love the Keck telescopes. I'm privileged to use them quite a bit. They're wonderful for looking at the faintest, most distant objects in the universe, all right? But you don't get much time on the Keck telescopes. The same will be the case to a greater extent with the 30-meter telescope that the University of California and Caltech are now planning to build. In fact, we were just approved um, construction just a, a few weeks ago. And that'll be really a fantastic instrument with which to peer at some fuzzy little blob in the sky that might be the most distant galaxy. I hope to use it. But the University of California share will be maybe 40 nights a year. And there's probably 100 astronomers. So if I'm lucky, I'll get one night a year. That's fine for certain types of research if I want to study some fuzzy blob, but not fine for other types, as I will describe this evening. So what kinds of research am I talking about at Lick Observatory? What kinds of work are we doing? Well, I'll give you just a sampling, a few topics. I'll start with probably my favorite topic, exploding stars, supernovae. Now, most stars, like our sun, will die a relatively quiet death. They don't explode. But some stars violently explode at the end of their lives, becoming millions or even billions of times as powerful as the sun. So if you like a good 4th of July fireworks show, well, exploding stars are the best such show you could hope for. for and they're really quite amazing to watch from a safe distance, of course. <laughs> Don't want to be too close to an exploding star. But here's one in a galaxy. Now, this is a galaxy of about 100 billion stars, and here's one star that blew up. And it takes several weeks to brighten, some months to fade. I've sped up the process here so as not to bore you. But at its peak, all right, let me try to stop it. If I can write right about there. It's about as bright as the central few billion normal stars in that galaxy. That's one star blowing up, OK? So if our sun were to do this, and it won't, Sunblock of 50 just wouldn't cut it, folks. You'd need sunblock or supernova block of a few billion to protect yourself. But don't worry, be happy. This is not what our sun's going to do. 
These explosions are of fundamental importance to us, humans, and indeed all of life, because these explosions cook up and eject into space elements heavier than helium. Okay, so carbon and oxygen will be produced by our sun eventually, but if our sun were to not explode, and if all other stars were to not explode, that carbon and oxygen would be locked up forever. To get the carbon and oxygen out, you need some stars to explode. Moreover, the explosion generates even heavier elements, like iron and things like that. We can tell that this is the case, because we can look at supernova remnants, the gases of stars that exploded long ago. Here's one that exploded about a thousand years ago. And from an analysis of those gases, we can tell that they consist not only of hydrogen and helium, but in fact of carbon, oxygen, calcium, iron, the very elements that we need to survive, right? The calcium in our bones, the iron in our red blood cells, the carbon in most of your cells, the oxygen that you breathe, the oxygen that is in water. All those elements come from exploding stars. So the exploding stars cook up and eject those elements into the cosmos where the gases spread out and meet up with other clouds of gas, become gravitationally unstable. They start collapsing, as in the central regions of the Orion Nebula. And in those central regions, you can then see new stars, stars that have only recently formed and stars that are still just forming. Here's an optical view, here's an infrared view. With the infrared, you can actually see a lot of the fainter stars. These are stars that just recently formed from a chemically enriched cloud of gas, the Orion Nebula, all right? And around some of those newly forming stars, we see disks of material. This is gas and dust that did not go into the star, but rather is in a disk around it, and it's sort of coagulating to form planets. So that's a planetary system in formation, two of them. And if you have a cloud like the Orion Nebula that has been sufficiently chemically enriched, well then, rocky, Earth-like planets can form. And our own solar system formed from a chemically enriched cloud of gas like this. All right? And on Earth, at least, somehow, life formed. And it evolved. And eventually sentient beings, humans, came into being. Creatures capable of understanding of our, our origins, of asking questions about nature and the universe and figuring out how we all got here. Here's part of my DNA, by the way. I have four children, two of whom are with me uh, on this trip. All right. We are, as Carl Sagan used to say, made of star stuff. He didn't discover this, but he popularized the idea that without these exploding stars, we would not be here. So there are many things that had to happen in the universe in order for you to exist, but one of those things was that at least some stars had to explode. So they're very important, exciting topics. Um, the study of this exploding stars are important, is an important, exciting topic. And to understand them better, we want to find nearby examples. Now that's not so easy to do because in a galaxy like this, a star might explode every 30 or 40 years. So if I were a really cruel advisor, I would have each of my students staring through the eyepiece of the great Lick refractor at one and only one galaxy, preferably at night. You see more stars and galaxies at night than during the day. Until he or she finds a supernova, then we let that student graduate and move on to greener pastures. <laughs> Meanwhile, I will have had decades worth of slave labor from that student. Now, there are some crimes that are so egregious that even a tenured professor can and should get fired, and that would be one such crime. Right? Can't take advantage of students that way. Well, but we could have them look at thousands of galaxies because, you know, if you look at more galaxies, the odds improve that there's going to be a supernova in at least one of those galaxies. But that would be cruel and unusual punishment to force them to look through the telescope at thousands of galaxies. Fortunately, with modern technology, we have a better technique. You attach a digital camera, a CCD camera, to the IP setting of a telescope, take photographs of thousands of galaxies, and then simply look for arrows. And where you see an arrow, you see an exploding star. You see it happened once, <laughs> twice, 
three times, four times, five times. By rigorous mathematical induction, I conclude that this process must work every time. Well, obviously, no. Otherwise, we wouldn't give degrees for this kind of work, okay? What we've done is we've developed a telescope that's small by today's standards, but has been programmed to take digital images of over 1,000 galaxies a night, nearly 10,000 in a week. This is the Katzmann Automatic Imaging Telescope, Kate, at Lick Observatory. And it compares the new pictures with the old pictures. Now, usually there's nothing new in the new picture, but occasionally there's something new. You see this arrow here. Actually, that was put in with Photoshop or something, but it's pointing <laughs> to that thing there. See, it used to not be there, right? So that's a supernova candidate. It could be an exploding star in that galaxy. It might be something else. It might be, for example, a charged particle that interacted with the detector. That sometimes happens. Or maybe it's an asteroid flying through the field of view, something like that. So we get maybe a dozen or two dozen candidates per night out of a thousand images. And then I use slaves, I mean students, who with their superior eye-brain combination examine the candidates and determine which ones are likely to be genuine supernovae worthy of follow-up observations. And um, it's just great to, to have these kids involved from their freshman or sophomore year in college. I occasionally even have a high school student, and they get to participate in the discovery of an exploding star. And they write home to their parents about it, and they just get really jazzed up. And they play with real data, they analyze data, learn statistical techniques, learn how to, you know, all kinds of things that you have to do with, when you're dealing with data. So it, it gets them very excited, and it gets them sufficient training to pursue all kinds of technical fields. Now, most of them don't become astrophysicists. That's okay, there's enough of us in the world. But they go on to fields that are more immediately useful to society, like computer science or engineering or applied physics. But I find that with kids, the hook is the cosmos, and giving them this real research experience gives them a sort of a, a head start and real motivation that, that students that didn't have this experience might not have. So I'm very proud of my team. Actually, this picture is a few years old. I should update it. In any case, the point is to find these supernovae. You don't need one or two nights a year on the very biggest telescopes in the world. You need lots and lots and lots of time on smaller telescopes, smaller, modest-sized telescopes, all right? That's something you can't and shouldn't do with the world's biggest telescope. It would be a waste of time. It would be an, a, an abuse of time on such precious telescopes, all right? This is going to be a mantra. You'll see it in many contexts here. Having found the supernova, we want to study it. We want to understand the chemical composition and why it's exploding and stuff. So we have to collect the light with a bigger telescope, in this case, a three-meter telescope. The bigger the collecting area, in a sense, the bigger the eye with which you're looking. And so you can collect the light, send it through a prism, produce a rainbow or a spectrum, as we call it, and analyze the spectrum. And from these dark bands here, you can learn the chemical composition, and you can learn things like the temperature of the star, and the, the pressure of the gases, and things like that. So it's this technique of spectroscopy that really allows us to learn about the objects that we're studying. And if you plot the brightness as a function of color or wavelength, you get plots like this. Here's the intensity or brightness as a function of color. Blue is down here, red is over there. Your eyes don't really see this. This is called the near infrared. But anyway, you get these squiggly lines. They kind of look like a roller coaster. But here's one type of supernova, a type 1A, and you can see calcium, oxygen, silicon, sulfur, iron, magnesium, calcium. These are the elements that were cooked up prior to and during the star's explosion. And these are elements that will drift out into space and eventually combine with other, some other cloud of gas and maybe form a planet that'll produce some kind of an alien maybe someday that'll look out into space and try to figure out how she, he or she or it got here, just as we have been doing. We are made of star stuff, okay? Here's another type of supernova. So we study these supernovae. And if we catch one that's really bright, here's one in a nearby galaxy, and we caught it, just when it was exploding. Well, then I can ask my buddies that have time on these telescopes 
to get spectra for me. And I, I'm up there as well sometimes. But we can get a series of spectra. So here's a bunch of these squiggly lines, okay? And they're labeled with a unit here. That's just time relative to peak brightness. So this was taken 12 days before peak brightness, 11 days, 9 days, roughly 8, 6, 5, 4, 3. Then there was a gap because of bad weather and the full moon, but whatever. The point is we have a spectral series here. Because I had access through my own time or the time that was assigned to my colleagues to a telescope that was capable of this kind of work. And if you ask a buddy who's got one night on the world's biggest telescope, if you ask them to get you a spectrum of something that they're not studying, they'll say, forget it. You know, I've got one night and I've got all this other stuff I've got to do, right? Whereas if it's a telescope that's not quite so precious in terms of the observing time, you can get a whole series of spectra and you can see these wiggles change. That's because we're getting kind of like a CAT scan of the supernova. Initially, we see light from the outer parts. The interior is hidden. It's like an opaque wall, okay? But as the stuff spreads out, it becomes thinner, it becomes transparent, and you see deeper into the innards of the exploding star. And so you can see where the iron is made and where the calcium is made and all this kind of stuff. So we get like a CAT scan. It's fantastic with a series of spectra like this. And these data are taken largely by students, okay? Especially now that we have remote observing facilities set up at each of the campuses of the University of California. We have a room with a bunch of computers, and it's as though we're up at the telescope. There's a very rapid link. We're talking to the telescope operator. We're operating the computers. We're operating the detectors. This is fantastic because undergrads generally don't have a car. They can't rent a car because they're not 25. And they might have morning classes or whatever. They can't spend four hours driving back and forth from Berkeley to the observatory or, you know, from UC San Diego. It's a much greater distance, so forget it, you know. But now that we have these remote observing stations, the students can get so involved, all right? It's amazing. And a student who has morning classes might take the shift up to midnight, and then a student with afternoon classes might take the graveyard shift. So it all works out. I've never had as many students in my group. I have 15 right now with 10 on the wait list in part because there's so much access now. So they get the data, and we also study not just the spectrum, we study the brightness. So here's sort of brightness versus time, and here are two different types of supernovae. And the point is, this teaches about the physics of what's going on. And we get these light curves with another telescope at Lick, a one-meter telescope, which, again, being a small telescope, is not in the great demand by most astronomers that say the Hubble Space Telescope is. Hubble Space Telescope is nearly impossible. Once a year we put in proposals. I cross my fingers. Because there are ten times as many proposals put in by astronomers as there is available time. So you have a 10% chance of getting any one project approved for a little tiny bit of time on the Hubble. Very competitive. But with these smaller telescopes, it's not so competitive. Students can get lots of time and they can learn. And again, because of these remote observing stations, they now learn much, much more, and they participate much, much more in this research than they did before we had these remote observing stations. I, mean, I, have, a, I have a big group now, not, not just undergrads, but grad students, postdocs. I bring them pizza once a week, and they justify their existence, okay? <laughs> this week I'm here in this lovely Acadia National Park, so I'm missing pizza lunch. But next week I'll ask them to justify two weeks of existence while I had a good time here at Skudik and Acadia overall. But once again, the, the point is, is to get a series of spectra or a light curve like this, you need to monitor the supernovae with smaller, modest-sized telescopes. You don't need the biggest telescopes in the world, and you're not going to get time with the biggest telescopes. Um, let me give you one cosmological application of supernovae. Cosmology is the study of the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole. And how many of you were at my talk at the Acadia Night Sky Festival about a year ago? Okay, so you heard the longer version of this. In fact, I'm giving you sort of a potpourri of topics, each of which justify, just justifies a one-hour talk. But the short version of this is that, as many of you know, the universe is actually expanding. You're not expanding, except after maybe a large meal, but that's your fault. That's not the universe's fault. Anyway, but the space between galaxies is expanding. And if we 
extrapolate this expansion back in time, we realize that long ago the universe must have been very compressed, very hot, in a very high density state. Indeed, it had a beginning where it was really hot and really dense, and we call that beginning the Big Bang. Okay, now some people don't like the term the Big Bang. That's just what we call it. You could call it something else if you want. You could call it, you know, Bertha D. Universe or something like that. But, <laughs> but that's, that's what it was 13.8 billion years ago. And if you want to learn about the 13.8 billion year history of the universe and the emergence of the solar system and life and complexity and all that, I urge you to go to the Naturalist Notebook. They have a straight 13.8 billion year history of the world that they're working on. But the short story is, is that the universe started out in this hot, compressed state. It's been expanding ever since. Galaxies formed, stars within those galaxies, and so on. Okay? So that's what it's doing right now. But there are all these galaxies in the universe, and they pull on one another. So what happens when things pull on each other? I forgot to bring my apple, but, you know, bottle works pretty well as well. I don't think gravity cares. When I toss the bottle up, the mutual gravitational attraction between the Earth and the bottle slows the bottle down, all right? It eventually comes to a halt. So if all these galaxies are pulling on each other, the universe's expansion should be slowing down. And if there are enough galaxies, that expansion should someday halt and then reverse itself. So you have a universe that would recollapse in on itself. It would implode. So if it starts out with a big bang, it ends with a big crunch. Or you could say Big Bang Gnab Gib, which is Big Bang backwards, okay? Big Bang Gnab Gib. So suppose you li live in that type of the universe, and you're out, you know, lying on your back, looking at the galaxies moving away, getting smaller and fainter with time, and you say, yes, I live in a nice, good universe. Then you keep watching, and you notice something peculiar. Right around now, you're getting a bit nervous. And then, ah, you know, goodbye, cruel world. That's what would happen in such a universe, all right? But there's also the possibility that the universe isn't dense enough. It doesn't have enough gravity to ever stop the universe from expand. Uh, from it, it'll never stop the expansion. In that case, you know, the universe could expand forever. That would be like you know a ball or an apple or a bottle thrown at a speed equal to or greater than Earth's escape speed. It would keep on going away from the Earth forever, always at a slower and slower rate. But nevertheless, it would never come back. Okay, and so. In that kind of a universe, the galaxies would keep on looking smaller and fainter forever. So we would like to know what the fate of the universe is, what's going to happen in the future. Well, how do you figure that out? Well, back to the bottle, if I were to measure the speed at many different times, I could see how much it's been slowing down. And I could predict whether it'll ever stop. If it's been slowing down a lot, it'll stop and it'll come back. If it hasn't been slowing down a lot, then it'll keep on going away from us forever. So in a similar way, if you measure the expansion history of the universe, you can predict the future. And the way to measure the expansion history is to compare the expansion rate right now with what it used to be. And the way we figure out what it used to be is by looking back in time. Now that may sound weird, but if you look at distant galaxies, you're looking at them as they were billions of years ago. If they're billions of light years away, then it took billions of years for the light to reach you. And so you're seeing them as they were billions of years ago. Okay, the typical stars you see in the sky are maybe 10 or 100 or 500 light years away, and so you're seeing as they were, you know, 10 or 100 or 500 years ago. But if you're looking at galaxies that are billions of light years away, then you're seeing them as they were billions of years ago, and encoded in the light that we receive is information about the expansion rate of the universe billions of years ago. So you compare it now with what it used to be. Well, you might say, sure, but how do you know how distant these galaxies are? Well, there we use a technique that you use all the time when you judge the distance of an oncoming car at night. You know how bright the headlights of a car really are, because You've seen a car that's, say, six feet away. You know, it's six feet away. You say, whoa, those are bright headlights. And then you look at dim headlights, and your brain kind of almost intuitively figures out how far away the car is. You're using the inverse square law of light. You don't have to think about that, but that's what you're doing. If you're not very good at judging the distance of an oncoming car at night using this technique, you shouldn't be driving at night. 
Okay, so the point is we find something bright in one of those distant faint smudges and we can tell then how far away it is and how far back in time we're looking. But normal stars aren't visible in those smudges because they're too far away. A supernova, however, is visible in a galaxy billions of light years away. Because remember, a supernova is the equivalent of billions of suns, and so it can be seen to a very great distance. So if we find nearby ones in galaxies of known distance, this is a sufficiently nearby galaxy that through other techniques we know its distance, well, if we measure its brightness and we know the distance, we can tell how powerful it really is. That's like the nearby car, okay? That's the car six feet away. You look at its headlights, you know how distant it is. You calibrate how powerful the headlights really are. Okay, so you've done that with the nearby guys. Then you go and you find the distant ones, the faint little ones, all right, in these scrawny-looking galaxies. And you compare the two. You compare the distant ones with the nearby ones, and that gives you the distance, and hence how far back in time you're looking. It's exactly like with the cars, okay? But you have to do this using both big telescopes for the faint distant guys, and for that we use the CAC telescopes in Hawaii and the Hubble Space Telescope. But we also need, need the, the smaller telescopes for the nearby ones. It's the comparison that's important. You can't just know the nearby ones or just the distant ones. You need both, okay? So, you know, when we did this exercise in 1998, we found out that the universe isn't slowing down. It's actually speeding up in its expansion, and that's something that's illustrated here, hard to show in one still image. Einstein is surprised because why should the universe be speeding up, right? It should be slowing down, either a lot, because there's a lot of gravity, and it'll someday come back, or a little bit, because there's only a little bit of gravity, and, you know, it'll expand forever, but always at a slower rate. But we found that in the last four or five billion years, the universe's expansion has been speeding up. Totally bizarre. The accelerating universe. We announced that in February of 98, by the end of the year, by December, no one had shot any holes through what we were doing. So uh, the editors of Science Magazine proclaimed this to be the single most important discovery in all areas of science. This accelerating universe implies that there's some sort of a repulsive stuff in the universe. We call it dark energy. And it constitutes 70% of the contents of the universe. It causes the space between galaxies to be spreading apart faster and faster and faster. Truly amazing. Then there's this dark matter. That's weird stuff too. That keeps galaxies bound, and we don't really know what that is either. The only stuff we really know about is ordinary matter. That's only 5% of the pie. And the easily visible ordinary matter, stars and planets and us, that's 0.5% on this pie diagram of the universe. So for the youngsters among you, there's not many, but there's a few, if they ever tell you there's nothing new to be discovered in the universe, you tell them, what about the origin and true nature of 95% of the universe? You know? The dark energy is there, but we don't know what it is. The dark matter is there, but we don't know what it is. So there's a lot to be learned. But the point is, we now know that these slices of the, of the pie actually exist. That one's been known for a while. And people used to think that that plus that was the whole pie. And what we found was, no, it's not the whole pie. There's this dark energy that fills the vacuum. What we thought previously was the vacuum between the galaxies is actually filled with this dark energy. So when you add it all up, it dominates. It doesn't dominate in this room, but when you add up vast volumes in the universe, which mostly have empty space, or so we thought, no, it's dark energy, and, and we don't know what it is. The dominant constituent of the universe, but it exists. And we found it through this comparison of nearby and distant supernovae. So this is so important that, in fact, the discovery was honored with the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. You know, first it was the discovery of 1998 and then Nobel Prize 13 years later, largely because the work was verified. Initially, people didn't believe us, and that's good. Healthy skepticism is good in science, but 
then everyone wanted to prove us wrong, and through the 13 years thereafter, they actually showed that they get the same answers. So we appear to be right. We don't know what the dark energy is, but it's there. So it was honored with the Nobel Prize. Now the rules of the Nobel are that it can go to at most three people. Uh, so it went to Saul Perlmutter, the, uh, the head of one of the teams. He's at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and Brian Schmidt uh, at the Australian National University was the head of the other team. And Adam Rees was my postdoctoral scholar in the mid to late 1990s when we did this work as part of Schmidt's team. So I'm glad that the committee recognized him as well. He's now a professor at Johns Hopkins, OK? Um, I have the interesting distinction of having been the only person who at one time or another was a member of both teams. I won't tell you that story tonight. But anyway, I was a member of both. And you know, some people say had there been four people recognized, I might have been the fourth, maybe not, who knows. But in any case, you know, the real joy was in doing the science. And these three gentlemen understand that without the rest of us, about 50 or so, working in the trenches, they wouldn't have been recognized in this way. So they spent a good fraction of their prize money flying us out to Stockholm to participate in Nobel Week of 2011. And there's the high redshift supernova search team, Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese, right after the award of the prize to them. And, um, and here's the other team on which I participated. I'm actually not in this photo because this was taken at a time that uh, the main team with which I was associated with having, was having its celebratory lunch at a fancy restaurant in Stockholm. So I'm not in that photo. But anyway, um, at that lunch, actually, my wife, Noelle, who's here, unveiled a new t-shirt that she gave to the rest of us as a consolation prize. Dark energy is the new black. And she even gave one of these to the king of Sweden. So anyway. <laughs> All right, so here you see, you know, sort of the utility, the cosmological utility of supernovae, but they're important for our existence as well. Let me accelerate a little bit, because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. My second topic is planets orbiting other stars. This is another really hot topic in astronomy, even though it's something I don't actually work on personally. But it addresses a fundamental question. Are there other planetary systems, and are any of them like our own solar system? We, re we would really love to know. Now, it turns out that when a planet orbits a star, the star isn't motionless. It moves a little bit because, uh, you know, if you have a planet orbiting a star, to satisfy the laws of physics, the star has to move a little bit in response to the motion of the planet. It's just that the star is a lot more massive, so it doesn't move as much. All right? That's what happens. And you can actually detect the motion of the star if you watch it carefully enough. The way in which we do this is we take spectra of the star, and sometimes the star is coming toward us, and sometimes it's going away from us, like that. So if you measure the spectrum over many, many, many months, or even years, you'll notice that sometimes the light from the star is blue shifted, because the star is moving this way in response to a planet moving that way. And sometimes the star's light is redshifted. And this is similar to the audible Doppler effect that you've all heard. Like when the siren is coming toward you and passes you, it goes like that. The light waves, in this case, or sound waves, in the case that you hear, are being squished when it's coming toward you and spread apart when it's going away. So you do this through spectroscopy, but you need a really good spectrograph. You need to spread the light out a lot more than is shown here, because you detect little tiny shifts. And this was done with an amazing spectrograph made by Professor Steve Vogt at UC Santa Cruz. It's called the Hamilton Spectrograph. And it was placed on the Shane three-meter telescope at Lick Observatory. And here are two of my colleagues, uh, Professor Jeff Marcy, who's at Berkeley, and at that time, his postdoctoral scholar, Paul Butler. They found, using the three-meter telescope at Lick, 70 of the first 100 known exoplanets. They really do exist, and up until 1995, you know, we didn't know of any of them. We suspected that they're out there, but we didn't know that they are there. And then in 95, 96, people started finding them. Here's where two planets were found. Cover of Time magazine, this is February 1996. Is anybody out there? How the discovery of two planets brings us closer to solving the most profound mystery in the cosmos. Really, are we alone? in terms of any life, and especially intelligent life. Well, you may have said, you may, have, you may think that there's already plenty of evidence that's published 
for the existence of life. Um, in fact, you know, here's some of that evidence. Alien backs Ar Arnold for governor. Uh, I wouldn't believe everything you read. Um, I'm not going to, well, I won't, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyway, we'd really like to know whether they exist. And to do that, you first need to find planets. You kind of need to know where to look. And the big Jupiter-like planets are the easiest to find because they're massive and they cause the star to move more than a little tiny guy, if this were not very massive like Earth then the star doesn't move as much. If it's more massive, then it moves a lot. So the Jupiters are easier to find. And here's an artist's impression. We don't have pictures of these things yet. Someday we hope to. But we would really like to find Earths, little guys, in what's called the habitable zone, the region that's at a distance from the star where liquid water might exist on the surface. Okay, that's... You know, water is thought to be a, a fundamental part of at least life as we know it. And so we would love to find Earths. But Earths are little guys. You need to monitor the motion of a star very precisely, night after night after night, okay, to find Earths. You need huge amounts of time, months or years, on modest-sized telescopes. And, you know, Jeff Marcy got a lot of telescope time on the three-meter telescope at Lick in the 90s and in the past decade. But now, we're, now we want to have even more time in order to find little Earths. So in fact, just in this past year, the latest telescope to be constructed at Lick Observatory was completed. A 2.4 meter, meaning roughly, the, in fact, the, exactly the size of the Hubble Space Telescope, was built. It's called the Automated Planet Finder. It has one purpose, basically, and that is to search for other planets, hopefully Earths. So it just sits around taking spectra robotically of the same stars night after night after night after night, okay? Right? Again, one or two nights a year, even four or five nights a year on the world's biggest telescopes are not going to do the trick. You need every night or every other night on smaller telescopes. And um, though the data are taken robotically, they're analyzed by students at various campuses. Here's Lauren Weiss, a graduate student at UC Berkeley. And in fact, again, you know, students are heavily involved in this very cutting edge research to find other Earths. Once we find them, we'll know in a sense where to point our radio telescopes to improve the odds of finding signals of extraterrestrial life. So that's a very exciting field. The third uh, science topic I want to talk about are giant black holes in the centers of galaxies. Now, black holes are really interesting regions. There are places where matter has been compressed so much that the local gravity is strong enough to prevent anything from escaping. Not even light will escape. So these things don't emit light, they don't transmit light, they don't reflect light, they just have nothing to do with light other than sucking it in. So here's my prize-winning photograph of a black hole. The effect is better in a darkened room, okay. I normally sell this for $10,000, but you, special price, 5K, okay. So, um, yeah, abandon all hope, ye who enter here, taken from Dante's Inferno. They're pretty scary places, right? They, they suck you in and they hold on fiercely. They don't let you get out. So astrophysicists have a saying, what happens in a black hole stays in a black hole. All right, well, how do we go about finding these things, searching for black holes? Well, we could take a hint from my supernova search and uh, take photographs of various parts of the sky and look for arrows. And maybe the arrows will point to dark regions here. Black hole there, there. Well, those aren't necessarily black holes. They're just spaces where there aren't stars or galaxies. So we've got to find some other technique. Now, we find a black hole not by seeing it directly, but by measuring its gravitational influence on its surroundings. So here's the idea, and here you don't even need Einstein's relativity theory, you just use Newtonian gravity, not just a good idea, it's the law. Here's the, here's the idea. Um, if you have a massive object that's being orbited by another object, and you measure the orbital speed of the smaller guy and its distance r from the bigger guy, that's all you need in order to figure out the mass of the bigger guy. Okay? And Suppose you do this 
and you find an object that's really, really, really massive, but completely dark. That would be weird, because, you know, stars are bright. They're massive, but they're, they're bright. If you find something really massive but dark, there's a good chance that it's a black hole. Well, it turns out that for decades, astronomers have suspected that there are giant black holes, millions or billions of times as massive as the sun, in the centers of certain types of galaxies called active galaxies. So here's a normal galaxy. There are all these billions of stars, but they kind of concentrate in the center because the gravity kind of makes them collect up there. And in an active galaxy, the same as in a normal galaxy, there's a general brightening toward the center. But then in the very center, there's a really bright thing. And we suspect that there's a black hole there. You might say, that, that's kind of weird. Didn't I just end up telling you that black holes don't let light out? So why would they be associated with an excess of light? Well, here's the idea. If you have a lot of stuff falling into a black hole, especially if it's swirling around like water going down a drain, then particles rub against one another and they convert their bulk energy of motion, their kinetic energy, they convert it into light. They radiate light very efficiently. If I had a whole bunch of bottles falling or swirling down into a drain, they would bump into each other and they would convert their energy of motion into light in a very efficient way. So in fact, as long as you do this outside the black hole, the light can escape, and it's a very efficient process. Incredibly efficient, even compared to nuclear energy. So that's the idea. You have gas falling into a black hole, but while it's still outside the black hole, it very efficiently radiates light. OK, so how do you prove that there's a dark, massive object there? Well, you have to measure speeds and distances. And I'm kind of running out of time, so I don't want to belabor the point here. But we do it through a combination of repeated measurements of the brightness of the active galactic nucleus with a little telescope like my Kate thing, and repeated measurements of the spectrum, which tell us, by analysis of that spectrum, they tell us how fast the gas is moving. So those combinations, repeated measurements over many, many months of the same galaxies can give us the data we need to calculate the mass of the object that's at the center. But you need months or years of time on smaller, modest telescopes. And students and postdocs get heavily involved in this work. Again, in part because we now have these wonderful remote observing stations. Here are three members of my team. And to make a long story short, we've monitored a bunch of galaxies with these active nuclei. And indeed, we've found that they have strong evidence for black holes millions or even a billion times as massive as our sun. And here's an artist's impression of what might be happening. It's sort of what I described to you. Gas is swirling in toward the black hole, but friction causes the gas to heat up and emit light very, very efficiently before actually going into the black hole. So we now think we have very good evidence for black holes. And that's interesting because Einstein's general theory of relativity suggests that black holes could exist. But Einstein himself felt that there's no way for nature to actually make black holes. So they're consistent with his general theory of relativity, but he didn't think they exist. So here he is kind of sad that the most bizarre possible prediction of his general theory of relativity is the existence or the possible existence of black holes, but he's sad that they don't exist. Well, if he were around now to see the evidence, his reaction might be something like this. You know, <laughs> black holes really do exist, OK? At least we think so, based on the data. OK, one additional topic, technology development. We can do a lot of technology development at Lick Observatory uh, and use it there or port it to other telescopes once it's been perfected. And the example, the one example I want to show you is laser guide star adaptive optics because it's so cool and because we've been the undisputed leaders in that area. The idea is the following. Our turbulent atmosphere blurs the images of stars if you look at them under high enough magnification through a telescope. And this is related to the twinkling of stars that you see. Stars twinkling, twinkle not because they're intrinsically variable, 
but because the light going through Earth's atmosphere gets bent every which way. And at one moment, light could be bent toward your eye, and so the star appears bright. And the next moment, it's bent away from your eye and towards someone else's eye. And so to you, the star looks faint, okay? And then the next moment, it looks bright again. So that's twinkling. You get a related blurring effect. And in fact, if you take images of a star many, many times a second under high magnification, it looks like that at the left there. But you know it's supposed to look kind of like this. In fact, it's supposed to look like my laser beam, um, you know, but are, at the very least, it should be nice and compact like this. Well, if you measure the light from a bright star many times a second, you can make a correction for this. Because after all, we can see where all these little blips are. And we can effectively um, combine them to form a nice steady image like this. And it turns out that the correction that you apply works for objects that are near the star. So if there was some object next to the star, the process of correcting the bright light from the star, making it look like that, applies to the object next to it as well, giving you a clear image of that object. So suppose I have a galaxy that's a little bit blurry, but I've got a bright star next to it, and I measure the light from that bright star many, many times a second, and, up, and I apply this correction factor, adaptive optics. You actually deform a little mirror in such a way that it gets rid of all that junk that you saw. Well, that correction will cause that galaxy to appear much clearer. Look at that, okay? So it's as though you're getting rid of the Earth's atmosphere through observations taken from the ground. That makes it as good as or better than Hubble. I love Hubble. You can do all kinds of things with the Hubble Space Telescope, like look at ultraviolet wavelengths and things like that. But the point is, we can now get clearer images over small areas of the sky with ground-based telescopes using adaptive optics. Um, but, you know, most galaxies, like that one or that one or that one, don't have a bright star right next to it. So what if you wanted to study that one? What would you do? Well, it turns out you can create a fake star by sending a laser beam along the axis of the telescope. In particular, this type of laser excites a layer of sodium atoms that are up there about 60 miles, 100 kilometers above Earth's surface. There's a layer of sodium atoms that are brought in actually by, um, by meteors. The Perseid meteor shallow world will bring in some of them tonight, you know, doing it right now, too, somewhere else on Earth. Anyway, so um, there's this layer of sodium. And up there in the sky, then you create a fake star, like my little laser dot there, all right? And if you take the fuzzy image of that dot and correct it, then that correction will apply to the object that you want to study, be it this galaxy, that galaxy, that galaxy, whatever. I can point the laser anywhere I want, right? I can make a fake star anywhere I want and use this correction technique, laser guide star adaptive optics, to then get a clear image of, of anything I want. And we perfected this technique using the three meter telescope at Lick Observatory. And then it was ported over to the bigger Keck telescopes, the 10 meter telescopes in Hawaii, which now use it routinely. And the Keck telescopes now are the undisputed world leaders in terms of scientifically interesting results using this laser guide star adaptive optics technique that was developed at Lick. So here's just a few examples. There's Io, one of the Galilean moons of Jupiter, uncorrected and corrected. Those blobs there are volcanoes. Io has the most volcanically active surface in the solar system, about 100 volcanoes going off at the same time. Here's the planet Uranus, the, but, the butt of many jokes. All right, before adaptive optics and with adaptive optics. First of all, there are those rings, thin little rings, not as glorious as Saturn's rings, but nevertheless, they're there. And then storms, which you can see, they change with time. And one reason we want to study other planets and their atmospheric circulation patterns and storms and stuff is to gain a better understanding of what happens here on Earth. Now, looking toward the center of our own galaxy, in the constellation Sagittarius, all right? Here's the uncorrected image 
There's the corrected image taken by a colleague of mine, Andrea Gez, in this case at UC Los Angeles, okay? But she and her group have been monitoring the galactic center for about two decades now, taking these snapshots. And you know what? The stars are moving around in the center part of our galaxy. Here's their motion. You can see the year at the upper left there. Zoom, zoom. Actually, I should get an updated video from her that goes up to 2014, but zoom, zoom. This one, actually, they've seen through a full orbit now. It's fantastic. They've, it's got an orbital period of 15 years. They've been monitoring it for 20 now. Anyway, these stars are going around something at the position of that red cross there. From the orbits, you can figure out that whatever is there has a mass four million times the mass of our sun. Yet it's completely dark, and it's within a volume smaller than our solar system. Well, you can't cram four million stars into such a small volume. Moreover, they would be bright even if they were there. But here we see only darkness. The Red Cross is put in by hand. We conclude that there's a black hole there. And so, in fact, we have to appropriately mark it with a Red Cross because it's a dangerous region. But this is, in fact, <laughs> the very best evidence we know of for a black hole um, is all these orbital motions of stars near the center of our galaxy. We are essentially certain, almost as certain as scientists can be, that there's a black hole there. If it's not a black hole, it's something really weird. The black hole is the conservative deduction. Okay, and then finally, public outreach. We do a lot of public outreach, and this is really important. All right? Lick Observatory is, in fact, the primary base for UC astronomy education and outreach efforts. Even though we also have the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, most people from California aren't going to go to Hawaii, or if they do, it's to relax on the beach or something, all right? So, in fact, our primary base for education and outreach is Lick Observatory. We have about 35,000 visitors a year. We're trying to increase that number. We've got a main building with exhibits and stuff, and various jokers explaining stuff. Um, we have a very active volunteer program. In fact, the volunteers, especially right now during the summers, allow um, or, or help people look through the, the great refractor. In fact, just um, a week ago, Saturday, I spoke at one of our summer programs, Music of the Spheres, where there's a concert that people listen to and then they can look through the great refractor, um, and while some of them are looking, I'm giving a lecture, and then they swap, and I give the lecture again. Um, Lick does a lot of stuff that really inspires the youth and sparks interest. And, you know, I like to say that the cosmos is what sparks kids' interest, all right? And they go on into other technical fields, generally, but it's the cosmos that sparks their interest. And as a kid, I was, of course, very inspired by the Apollo lunar landings and stuff. So anyway, it's a great chance to involve them. We're trying to increase our multiplier factor by training teachers. We have a, an active teacher institute, the Lick Observatory Teacher Institute, where we teach teachers how we actually deal with data so they can then impart their knowledge onto the students. It's amazing how little students in middle school and high school learn about actually what it is that scientists do in terms of dealing with data and stuff. And so we're, uh, we're teaching the teachers. It's just an amazing place overall, a unique Bay Area treasure and a place of, of great beauty. And we have big plans for the future, just very briefly. Um, we're still studying exploding stars, both to understand them better and the origin of the elements and to understand them so that we can figure out what the dark energy is. Here's one that we found just a few hours after it exploded. You see in this image on July 8th, there's nothing obvious there. And then two days later, July 10th, there it is. Um, we found this thing, it turns out, when it was just a few hours old. It's amazing, all right? So through studies of supernovae in greater detail, we'll understand them better. We'll be able to better quantify the expansion history of the universe and thus learn what the dark energy might be, or at least what it's not, you know? So that's one of the things I'm working on. In terms of the planets, we'd like to find exoplanets around the hundred or so stars that are within 20 light years from us. There's the sun, there's a catalog of stars. 
with the automated planet finder, we are concentrating on those stars that are relatively nearby. So that if we do find Earth-like planets, we'll have sort of a clue as to where to look if we're searching for ET. You know, it's, if you know where to look, it's higher odds than just pointing in random places in the universe. And then we'd like to do, um, we'd like to do a sky survey. So here's a photograph of dark skies, in this case from Chile, at optical or visible wavelengths. We'd like to do an infrared survey of the sky from the observatory, just to give you some idea of what you gain by looking at the universe at other wavelengths. Here again is a picture I showed before, the Orion Nebula, this collapsing cloud of gas and dust in which new stars recently formed and are still forming. This is the visible view in the infrared. You can see more clearly through all this junk, and you can see the, the stars um, that are being formed. So infrared tells you something other than what the visible wavelengths tell. So we'd like to do that. We're improving ad our adaptive optics techniques. We now have on the Shane three meter telescope a new AO system. And in fact, here just from a few months ago are the first images ever taken with this new system. So here it is uncorrected, here it is corrected. This ring may seem um, bad to you, but in fact it's good. It means our system is working. Anytime you actually pass light through a mirror or through any opening or something like that, you get what's called the diffraction pattern. You get a ring around it. And normally you don't notice that ring because your image is too fuzzy. But if your image is really sharp, then you'll notice that ring. So that, that's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, so we're really improving uh, our adaptive optics. And in fact, even though this technique was developed at infrared wavelengths, we are now moving it into optical wavelengths as well to get clear optical views, not just infrared views. So we're very excited about that. We're improving our public outreach and education. For example, we're partnering with schools in the Bay Area and with schools in Europe, in this case in Ireland, where the students in Ireland can use the one meter telescope that I showed you during the day for them, and it's nighttime for us, so they can actually take data um, in Ireland using our telescope. And then they partner with a, a school in the Bay Area to discuss the results and stuff. So we're starting that kind of a program. We're doing more astrotourism. We want more people to look through the 36-inch refractor and visit the observatory. So we're doing a, a lot of stuff for the future, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Let me just summarize what I've said so far and then finish up. I hope I've shown you that Lick is vital for research. It's done outstanding research throughout its history, and it continues to do outstanding research. And it has an especial niche where it comes to projects that require giant amounts of time repeatedly on the same telescopes throughout the year or through many years of time. Something you can't do at a lot of the other observatories. And it's used a lot for technology development. Here's a grad student and a postdoc who then uh, developed a new type of instrument that I didn't have a chance to discuss uh, with you. But you know, we then use those new instruments at Lick and we port them elsewhere. We do a lot of hands-on training of graduate students and undergraduate students and postdocs. This is how they learn. And through this early exposure to research, even undergrads receive the training and inspiration that gets them propelled into positions of future leadership in many areas of science and technology. We're really very proud of that because with like the Hubble and stuff, undergrads can't touch that thing. And the 30 meter telescope, forget it if you're an undergrad. Even the Keck telescopes, maybe one or two undergrads help out a little bit. But 15, no way, okay? There's just no way. So, uh, but they can help with, uh, with the telescopes at Lick, and they play a really important role. An important part of uh, what we do at Lick is that grad students and postdocs can conduct their own projects. So normally their training as scientists goes like this. They join a department, like my department at Berkeley, and they become an apprentice to me. And they learn the skills, they learn the tricks of the trade, and that's normal. But I give them projects that I have largely defined and I know what they're supposed to do, and I help them out as they learn. 
that's fine. But another, if anything, more important part of the training of a future leader is to give them a chance to design and conduct and conclude their own project where they are the leader. And I occasionally chime in with a little bit of help if they need some. Okay? This is the kind of work they can do at Lick, and they can't do it at the extremely precious telescopes like Hubble, because there's just there's no way that uh, a professor is going to give their small amount of time to, um, you know, to, to uh, a student or a postdoc to conduct their own project. And then we do a lot of this public education and outreach, you know, really a, an, an amazing place. So it has great historical significance as a California landmark and also as an educational institution that has done and is continuing to do cutting edge research, education, and instrument development. Please join me in thanking Alex again. OK. Thank you. And, and as we put stuff away here, I'll be glad to answer any other questions you might have. A couple more things yeah. I want to mention briefly. Uh, you may have seen this on your way in, but there is an exhibit of art in the lobby here of the auditorium by an artist named Jane Runyon that is uh, nicely tailored for tonight's topic because it is art primarily inspired by astronomy and also fireworks. Uh, you can read a little bit about that out there as well. We are in a niche that is in some respects very similar and citizen science, as a question was just raised at the end, is a big theme of what we do here. I think we all recognize the value of science and science education to the public quite broadly and appreciate you being here to contribute to that conversation. Um, coming up in uh, later this fall, we have a three-day series of events that will also be on our website for registration and newsletter, including one day focused on the intersection between art and science, second day as Acadia's Science Symposium, and the third day the Down East Research and Education Network's uh, Convergence Conference that brings conservation into that conversation. So lots going on here as well, and thanks again for being here. And then the Perseid meteor shower out on the field here. You just go out, take a right, go down the steps, and that'll deposit you on a big field where we're hoping we'll ha have a nice clear sky with a, a nice wide horizon. You, know, you don't want to be in a clump of trees. <laughs> and, and I'll be very happy to answer questions uh, as we're standing there waiting for meteors, too, for those who want to come. I realize tomorrow is a work day, so Many of you probably can't stay very late, but, but uh, we'll give it a try at least. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much.